It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 242 at block height 655,026 on Sunday, November 1st. So what is up, Janine? How was your white paper day? Uh, Pretty good, because I released another issue of my newsletter, so had fun with that. Woo! W- wish I could talk no candy. about about my day but i think uh i think that would push the edge of what uh what might get us kicked off of youtube all righty then tmi let's just say that um a buddy of mine who who was tripping his balls off yesterday has provided much valuable insight on the subliminal messaging of the old 1960s spider-man cartoon and I don't think I'm ever going to be able to look at that show the same way. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> I am just preparing for the hell that will be the next week. Oh, it's going to be so fun. No, I I do not consider mass hysteria and mass loss of reason and critical thinking to be fun of course it is just hold on to those things yourself and then look down at everybody else acting like an idiot and know that you're better than them no doesn't work (laughs) alrighty alrighty want to just dive into it for the day sure Let's so, go. let us see what is first. So, Anthony Towns um, posted a uh, a blog post on soft fork activation mechanisms. Um, given that Taproot is now merged into Core, um, despite no activation mechanism uh, attached to that, um, and apparently. Um, he was running around kind of quietly asking developers to fill out a survey in terms of different types of activation methods or thresholds and how um, different developers feel about that. So before getting into the conclusion he reached, I'm just going to kind of try and buzz through some of these as quickly as possible. Um, So... The first thing he was asking about was um, minor activation, Um, so BIP9 style deployment. And he was asking kind of what what threshold of that are people comfortable with. And out of, I think, in total 13 people answered this, um, eight selected somewhere between 85 um, to 95%. Um, Four people selected um, numbers as low as 60% and one person um, selected 75. So just looking at this, um, pretty much anybody looking at mining and signaling as an activation mechanism is heavily skewed towards kind of leave it roughly where it is now um, with BIP9, which would be 95%. also, he asked uh, how long should the signal period um, or how long will it take um, to actually have the threshold met and activation? And pretty much um, there is a big distribution between um, up to 12 months and up to three months. And it was kind of roughly split down the middle. So kind of a pretty decent balance between optimism and pessimism there. 
And then he also asked how long it should take um, before the software release and the activation actually beginning. Um, and most people were kind of pushing for a figure around three months. But really, it, it just goes to show that in, in terms of people thinking about mining activation, um, there's not really a lot of support in terms of deviating from the current 95% or very close to that as an activation threshold. And then the, the next section, he was asking questions about um, people looking for um, a flag day activation mechanism. Um, and the first question here he asked was kind of what are people's biggest concerns? Um, and two of the biggest are pretty much um, just how many people are actually enforcing that. Like two, two of the biggest concerns were, will there be enough um, support period um, by the time the flag day arrives to make it economically not practical or rational to not comply with that. Um, but there was also a lot of concern um, in the sense of how many people might enforce the rules, but not until after the flag day. So people who kind of wait until after that has passed before they actually enforce that. And, you know, this is kind of showing me here that a lot of developers at least the ones who answered this survey are kind of hesitant for this type of mechanism because you know that there is no objective measurement point in terms of economic nodes enforcing something like there is with minor signaling um and then the obvious next question was how long um should the flag day be and pretty much most people um, we're looking at 12 um, or 18 months as an acceptable time frame um, with two people even considering a 36 or 48 month time period, um, which in my mind is absurdly over conservative. Um, and so then the question comes up of when is a flag day decided? And so nine people here um, want to wait and see how uptick, like how the miners behave, how many miners upgrade, what the new downloads for such a thing um, supporting Taproot would be before even considering the flag day. And only four people um, supported the idea of pretty much just setting the flag day before the, the client that would activate it is even deployed. And another big um, concern here was how do you pick the flag day? And so there was a lot of a uh, a lot of weird disagreements, such as, well, I don't know what seems good or this time period or whatever the BIP authors say. And there was also a question of um, how do you know that there is enough community support? for a flag day. Um, 10 people here um, pretty much just said uh, enough time has passed for people to object, um, but no objections were made. Um, nine people want to look at the um, adoption rate of software through a minor activation mechanism um, and use that as a gauge for flag day activation. Um, eight people responded um, that we see manual signaling. Um, so there's a, 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 a large divide here in terms of how do we know this? And um, there was four people who said that we already do. <laughs> um, personally, I'm of that mindset. Um, and then really the, the last question I'm going to dig into here um, was how should users opt into a flag day support? And seven people answered it should never be opt-in. It should just be the default software deployment. Um, five people decided that they should just force an upgrade to a new client um, 
rather than baking in a config option. Four people wanted to have a configuration flag and four people um, effectively argued just um, fork the client like we did with BIP 148 and do that. And six people um, decided that editing the source and recompiling it yourself um, should be a mechanism. Um, I cannot believe, honestly, that six developers actually thought that was a rational way for software like this to be deployed um, for normal people. Like th that, that to me is just absurd that that is the barrier that should be placed in front of users to be able to run a flag day activation variant if that was something that started gaining support because that is exactly how you just start creating weird games um who's gonna trust who in terms of doing that because most most people aren't capable of doing that and so there's also a, a long section of um, free form um, comments. Um, I'm not going to go through those because those are pretty long, um, but you can check the show notes to find where that is. But at, at the end of the day, um, Anthony Towns' proposal at the end of all of this is to effectively deploy um, a version that is BIP9 only um, with a 12 to 24 month timeout um, and just leave the 95% activation mechanism and then see um, how that goes. And if that winds up um, being a repeat of what happened with SegWit activation, then the idea would be to release a new minor release of Bitcoin Core with a locked in um, flag day activation. Um, his proposal is 18 months past the start of the original minor activated deployment. Um, and then just institute a flag day after that. But part of that flag day would be to force um, miners signaling for taproot activation the same way that the BIP 148 client did with SegWit. Because just the it's it's the exact same kind of problem we ran into there if we deploy a minor activated um, version of the software but then later deploy a flag day um, if the economic momentum of that flag day implementation does not also force miners to activate um, the minor activated variant then anybody who hasn't actively upgraded to a flag day client um, would never actually activate taproot or start enforcing those rules. And so he's kind of looking at this, if, if we do a minor deployment first and then a flag day, that flag day has to enforce um, minor signaling as part of that condition, or we're looking at the same kind of chain split potential, although with a lot less contention um, that we did during BIP 148. And so, Really, honestly, I think this is probably the most comprehensive breakdown of all the different thoughts and variables in soft fork activation. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this sounds really good to me. I can't find any material problems or holes in this. Um, so unless somebody does sometime soon, let's get the ball rolling and do this. Yep. And also developers need to stop writing things that take me like 10 minutes to rant nonstop and not have a chance to, to have a drink. You can't rush consensus. Oh, yes, I can. Watch me. Well, as this is an audio only podcast, I can't exactly watch you. Touche, smarty pants. <sighs> But uh, yeah, if, if you don't have any uh, opinions you want to toss out on that, I do believe a lobbying group that irritates me more than not has responded to some ludicrous FinCEN proposals. Yeah, so in the last episode, 241, we talked about various businesses and organizations getting together to create a darknet for sharing personally identifying information about cryptocurrency users. 
did I say Darknet? I totally meant to say Darknet, because if you remember, uh, the white paper essentially argued that they should create an encrypted private peer-to-peer -peer network with uh, minimal data retention. And boys and girls, that is what the lamestream media often refers to as the Darknet. So they're building a Darknet, and I'm running with this meme. Anyway, uh, three days after that white paper came out, um, FinCEN and the Federal Reserve announced that they had, quote, invited comment on a proposed rule that would amend the record keeping and travel rule regulations under the Banking Secrecy Act or Bank, Se Bank Secrecy Act <laughs> to uh, basically lower the applicable threshold for uh, transmittable funds that begin or end outside of the United States to one twelfth of the current standard. And uh, if anyone didn't notice, October 23rd, when this uh, was announced, happens to be the fifth anniversary of the banking of the Bank Secrecy Act's approval. Yay! Birthdays. Um, but yeah, so the in the announcement it says, under the current record keeping and travel rule regulations, financial institutions must collect, retain, and transmit certain information related to fund transfers and transmittals of funds. I don't know why they have to say the word funds so many times um funds over three thousand dollars the proposed rule lowers the applicable threshold from three thousand dollars to two hundred and fifty dollars for international transactions the threshold for domestic transactions remains unchanged at three thousand dollars uh, it also says the proposed rule also further clarifies that those regulations apply to transactions above the applicable threshold involving convertible virtual currencies as well as transactions involving digital assets with legal tender status by clarifying the meaning of money as used in certain defined terms. So yeah, um, this would uh, basically mean, like, because I mean... This applies in the U.S., and obviously I think it also applies to just American citizens generally. Um, so, like, if you're an American living outside of the U.S., if you make any transaction above $250, apparently you have to dox lots of things to them for unclear gains as will be criticized um by coin center but first of all um this is something i included in my newsletter which is that a uh, financial writer um jp koenig wrote in the american institute for economic research that this proposed threshold of 250 dollars would shift the u.s from being one of the world's most permissive nations to the least permissive nation and uh jim harper whose uh um, irs lawsuit we've previously talked about um, I've not seen an update on that, by the way. I would like to know what's happening with that. But he uh, argued in the American Enterprise Institute in an article that he would emphasize the cost to innovation that is clearest to me in the area of cryptocurrency and decentralized finance, where untold projects and companies uh, have not advanced because of financial surveillance rules and other regulatory requirements. And he actually wrote a book about how uh, identification uh, processes are being abused and overused. That's a good book. But uh, one second while I scroll. I swear to God, I need to like record a loud sample of a mouse scrolly wheel and just start editing that in every time. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. I, I approve. Um, but anyway, so the meat of this is that on October 29th, FinCenter published a copy of the comments that they had filed in response because, you know, FinCEN and the Federal Reserve asked for comments. So very predictably, you got tons of people on Bitcoin Twitter sharing the comments that they were sending, and maybe some of them were not so great and may actually backfire on us um, in terms of the effect. But anyway, Coin Center filed a response um it was kind of unclear because the response was dated november 2nd but they published the comments on the 29th so i'm not sure what what the dating is on that but anyway they file a response and it says imposing new regulatory obligations on americans should be done only when the benefits of doing so outweigh the costs the costs in question are costs to society, not merely to regulated parties, and the costs and benefits to be considered should include difficult 
uh, to quantify values like human dignity, of which we see is a paramount component. Requiring this kind of cost-benefit regulatory analysis not only helps agencies choose the best regulatory alternative, but it compels policymakers to show their work in a way that allows the public to provide meaningful comment. Present notice of proposed rulemaking fails to do this. While the agencies considered the cost that lowering the threshold for certain AML obligations would impose on financial institutions, there is no discussion whatsoever of the cost that the change would impose on individuals and society. Yes, financial institutions should bear the direct cost of a change, but the greater cost may be incurred indirectly by the thousands or millions of citizens that a change would affect. That cost is not easily quantifiable because it is a cost in privacy for gone, but it should not be ignored. And then they go into, you know... Uh, their own arguments about the harm that this will cause and the fact that there's very little benefit they're going to get out of this because basically their argument for why they should drop it to 250 is because they found some data that shows that the median payment size is around $250. So they think that's like a good threshold to have for requiring you to dox a bunch of stuff to people and to also share that information with a bunch of people like your bank sharing it with other banks and they don't really give a good you know i mean they they the argument they always use is well structuring you know you can like make multiple little payments in lieu of making a big payment therefore we have to drop the threshold and it's like Okay, but (laughs) all that's going to happen is that they're going to start structuring below $250. Like, sure, is it more inconvenient? Yes, it is. But uh, criminals are going to criminal. I I don't know what else to say. Like, they, they think that they're geniuses now because they've made the numbers smaller Like, all they're going to do is inconvenience a bunch of individuals. They're going to inconvenience a bunch of companies and businesses and banks that now have to accommodate this new threshold, which means they're going to have to basically dox a bunch more people than they were before and dox a bunch more transactions every day. Like, it's just going to be a huge inconvenience, and I would be shocked if they got any substantial benefit out of doing this it's just all this does increase financial surveillance and one question i want to ask um although i I, it's more rhetorical is are are third-party payment processors vasps that have to comply with this because 250 dollars for something like that in a global um you know digital market um think about the absurd low bar of i'm buying something from somebody not in the US and now, oh, what? All of my personal information has to go to their payment processor too, not just them. Like for like, I I couldn't even find a a laptop for less than 250 bucks that wasn't a complete piece of shit. Like, really? Yeah, I mean, it would would basically depend on whether your business is already subject to the Bank Secrecy Act and money transmitter regulations and if it is then this would apply to you i don't think they're changing anything fun- fundamentally about who it applies to with this they are just changing the threshold as far as i'm concerned that just shows yet another reason why it is incredibly important for people to accept and process their own payments when you have things like BTC pay out there rather than use third parties, because I don't see how a payment processor um, on behalf of somebody else isn't eventually roped into this or has to comply with this. Mm Mm-hmm. Fucking FinCEN. Or as uh, Marty called it, FinCEL. (laughs) Ah, yeah. Well, ready to talk about another group of douchebags? Sure. So some of the details are a little vague here, but um, yeah. Okay, yes, They're yes. So vague, you go on silent. Well, I, I lost my place in the news desk for a second. I wasn't sure which one was next. But um, okay, it's not the one I was referring to as shady douchebags necessarily. <clears throat> but um, 
Uh, Forbes published an article um, claiming to have a leaked internal document um, titled Tai Chi um, from Binance. Although I do want to say um, they did not provide the source document. Um, there is nothing but a single um, picture from a single page in this document. Um, and um, CZ, the head of Binance, has completely denied the contents of this. But <clears throat> to, to go into what Forbes is claiming, um, th this purported document effectively laid out a plan um, for Binance to specifically create a, an American um, subsidiary or company um, that would fully comply with U.S. regulations, um, but specifically just to kind of throw regulators off of their scent by having a, a different business um, for U.S. citizens compliant with U.S. regulations. Um, and pretty much structuring that company um, so that most of the, the money passing through from that to the main Binance um, incorporated entity would not be shareholder or ownership related. It would effectively be all around licensing fees um, for Binance's trading platform, IP, things like that. Um, <clears throat> with the rationale being, um, this licensing agreement, rather than being an outright subsidiary, um, would be a shield between the U.S. company and Binance proper as far as transferring liability up the chain for any kind of uh, regulations violation in America. And from this point, um, pretty much try to educate users and make it as easy as possible to circumvent their um, geo um, tracking attempts to block U.S. citizens with things like VPNs and not really, um, you know, try to make those robust enough to really work. Um, pr pretty much the accusation is this is a wink, wink. We have a regulatory compliant U.S. company and wink, wink, um, U.S. people can't trade on our main platform where there are products they are not allowed to interact with. And, um, in context with this, um, last month, uh, the Japanese exchange Fisco um, filed a lawsuit in the District of California or Northern California, um, pretty much alleging Binance is a complicit um, business in money laundering, um, having specifically set themselves up to facilitate this. And now th this I do want to point out in, in the context of all of this, because there is not even a direct source document completely published that I was able to find. Um, that is really weird to me that a Japanese exchange is suing a Chinese exchange in America. Uh, it, it just, it, it, it reeks to me regardless of whether the allegations are true or not, like a, a competitor just attempting to undermine um, their competition through the legal system. Uh, but the, the kind of last relevant um, point here is Forbes contacted the FBI regarding these documents <clears throat> and rumors that um, they had copies of them and were actually investigating Binance. And initially, the FBI refused to acknowledge anything in any way but later contacted Forbes with an official statement of no comment. And so, you know, kind of untangle all of this a little bit. Um, CZ is denying this. Um, Forbes did not actually publish um, the entirety of this document, but they are claiming a former um, Binance employee is the one who wrote it and that uh, High-level Binance officials have seen this document, and the allegation that the FBI is investigating them for these issues. Um, so I just want to kind of be clear here. There's a lot of accusations here and a lot of circumstantial things, but there's not quite a, a smoking definitive gun or anything. Um, no agency has publicly indicted or made comments based on this, but. Um, I would not be shocked in the slightest bit if this is actually true in terms of the allegations and true 
that U.S. government agencies are investigating this right now. Um, and I shouldn't have to do more than point at what just happened with BitMEX over the last few months um, to kind of make the case. U.S. regulators and agencies are really starting to gun hard for those platforms that let Americans get around the financial controls they want applied to everything. So, yeah, I, I would not be shocked in the slightest if uh, Binance is the next company to really have a, a hammer come down on them in that regard. So what you're saying is funds are not safe. No, funds are always safe. Yeah, I mean, all I have to say about this is really like, show the docs, where the docs, give the docs. Um, also, yeah, not would not be surprised if the U.S. government was investigating them. Um, but also, where are the docs? Show us the docs. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that that was the weirdest part about this for me, really, is that somebody like Forbes making such a material accusation like this and not like just publishing the entirety of their source. Like, why would they not do that? That just seems odd. Because it might be hacked material and you're not supposed to publish that anymore, you know? <laughs> I thought I thought that that only applied to the hacker themselves now, though. Didn't, didn't that get, get changed again? No, it's just you don't touch hack stuff ever. Don't look at it. Don't don't look for it. Don't touch it. Nothing. Will it burn your eyes out? Probably. It's probably filled with Russian poison. Oh no. They use radioactive poison. Okay, I'm never looking at any hacked anything ever again. All right, smart ass good, redone good, though. Good news is that um. You know, you need like 15% or something of someone's password to hack stuff, so we're all safe. <laughs> all right, all right, though. Um, <laughs> Smart assery aside, uh, now moving on to another group of douchebags. So, a lot of the specifics of this are kind of unclear. Um, but the uh, Ministry of Energy and the Central Bank of Iran have um, passed legislation or, or an edict or whatever technical term um, in that legal process, um, pretty much requiring miners who are registered in the country to sell all of their coins to the Central Bank of Iran. And now it's, it's not clear if this is um, you are forced to sell all of the coins you mine, um, or just if you are going to sell something, you are required to sell it to the Central Bank of Iran. Um, but there is mention of kind of looking at the, the rates or amounts you must sell and correlating that to how much of your energy consumption is subsidized by the Iranian government. And so they're still working out details, but um, regardless of which one that is, um, miners will only be able to sell their coins to the Central Bank of Iran. And they are specifically doing this um, to accumulate a stockpile of Bitcoin um, to pay for imports because of how much of a pain and how much friction there is with all of the sanctions the US has levied against them to get their hands on foreign currency to pay for imports. Um, they're just going right to the source. Um, cheap energy, sell that to miners. Um, now you have to sell us your coins. Um, and this is, this is just fucking crazy. Like re regardless of how fascistic or or whether they force you to sell everything or or just if you are going to sell you have to sell to them um i'm not really so interested in the mining regulation aspect of this um this is something i think is going to start happening everywhere it's the fact that their central bank is putting bitcoin 
on its balance sheets to pay for imports because that is the easiest thing for them to get their hands on. Like th this is something that has been talked about in depth, memed about in depth for years. The idea of a actual nation state who is being financially sanctioned by, by superpowers like the US inevitably being pushed into using Bitcoin to get around that. That just actually happened. Like this is a landmark moment in terms of the degree of seriousness with which geopolitical actors look at Bitcoin and consider how that can affect the overall geopolitical environment. And this is a door that Bitcoin just walked through that it will never go back through. And like, I, this is just insane to me. Like we, we are actually in a world now where openly and publicly for the exact reasons people in this space speculated something like this would happen for years is holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Like, yeah, I'm, this yeah, is going to get mean, crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yep. A uh, side effect of U S sanctions is that the Iranian government, or at least the central bank is about to get loaded with Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Tough, tough luck. U S government. Um, <laughs> look, look what you did. Um, yeah, I mean, this not shocking to me at all. I mean, I like they're doing it first, but it it is completely predictable to me. You have a state who has the ability to make these kinds of uh, policies and force people to surrender their property, uh, whether surrender it in a particular way or actually surrender it, all of it. Um it does not surprise me that the central bank would think, well, we're, we need money. Uh, and here's a group of people who are not only sort of vulnerable in terms of their dealing with uh, digital currency that is, you know, kind of in a legal gray area everywhere in various ways. And they're relatively easy to find because they have a lot of equipment and they're basically running a business. Um, at least the most successful ones have to. And so they're going after some of the, you know, rather most visible part of the people using Bitcoin in Iran. And that it makes sense for them to be like, well, State gonna state, if you want to exist, you have to give us all your Bitcoin. Um, that does not surprise me. And it does also not surprise me that uh, this is the unintended consequence of sanctions, is that uh, the state, despite mostly being full of dumb, aggressive people for the most part, are going to start getting creative. That's what happens when you poke the bear. <laughs> but I mean, <clears throat> that, that, that's kind of what worries me here though is is this is just the the game theory stepping up another order of magnitude and the players being nation states i mean like quite frankly like this country the us we've demolished the entire middle east over the last 20 years just to reshape the political geography to make it uh more stable or try to at least we fucked up miserably um, so that we can suck oil out of the region. Um, and if you just look at what's going on politically in, in the Middle East right now, it's a three polar area. You have Israel, you have Iran, you have Saudi Arabia. Those are the three relevant players. And with what Trump is doing in that region right now, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the Arab Emirates are all entering into peace agreements with Israel. And he is claiming, um, and I don't see any reason to doubt this, that more countries in that region are looking to normalize relationships with Israel like that. So the, the entire tripolar balance 
is shifting heavily towards Saudi Arabia and Israel. Even like, like forget America for a minute, directly bombing Iran because we've wanted to do that for decades. Um, what about other nations in that region? When you start seeing that consolidation into a block in Iran using something like Bitcoin to bypass the, the pressure a coalition like that could put on them. Like, these are the types of things wars start over. And like, th that won't stop Bitcoin chugging along, um, won't kill Bitcoin. But, you know, right now, this is Iran is gaining an advantage in Bitcoin. Um, years down the line, that could wind up biting them in the ass and being the thing that pushed other people over the edge to actually attack them. Like, you know, when nation states start getting involved in things, it starts becoming more a, a game between nation states. That's just how things work. Yeah, let the big cats fight over the mouse. I mean, it's it's just things that worry me, you know what I mean? Like, at the, the state we are in, in terms of size and scale and how fast we're growing, like, that's the type of territory we're moving into over the next few years. Like, that, this isn't just going to be meme games on the internet for much longer. Anyway, though, um, since World War III hasn't started yet, uh... Why don't you tell us about something that really has me sad and worried about um, what's going to happen with Internet Archives in the next few years? Yeah, so the Internet Archive, uh, otherwise known as the Wayback Machine, that's based out of San Francisco, has announced that they are going to start adding fact check banners to some archived web pages. Um, and in the announcement, they say, We are attempting to preserve our digital history, but recognize the issues around providing access to false and misleading information coming from different sources. By providing convenient links to contextual, contextual information, we hope that our Patrons will better understand what they're head, what they're reading in the Wayback Machine. Um, and so if you go to their post, uh, you can see in their examples that there's this yellow bar that appears at the top um, and contains text such as, this webpage has been fact-checked by PolitiFact. Uh, here, URL to fact-check matching provided by our.news. Another one says, this is an archived web page that Medium.com determined violated their content policy. Here is a link to it on the live web. In most instances, the archiving of a page is an automated process. The inclusion of a page in the Wayback Machine should not be seen as, as an endorsement of its content in any way. Um, so those are some of the examples. And I mean, this isn't really a Bitcoin story, but given that, you know, there is a lot of content related to Bitcoin that has probably been archived in the Internet Archive over the years, this is still important. Uh, I mean, I use the Internet Archive a lot. Um, one of the interesting uses of the archive is not just to access pages that have been changed or deleted, which is important in terms of my revision controlled journalism project, but also um, sometimes, you know, you want to share a page with people, but not necessarily give traffic to that page. Um, for example, a lot of the times uh, when I've, you know, linked to, for example, blockchain surveillance company blog posts or something like that, I don't want to give them traffic. Um, specifically, I don't want to give them traffic that they could possibly um, you know, if it's linked, if they're, if they're getting analytics information that the, uh, person coming and clicking on the link from, you know, our YouTube video or something, they might be able to see that. So when it comes to sites that I think are potentially malicious or might be interested in that kind of information, I archive them as a way for people to visit the archived copy instead so that they're not giving traffic to that site. Um... So yeah, I, I use the Internet Archive a lot and I think it's important and my opinion on this proposal is that I really don't like it. I do not think that it's a good idea to be mixing the role of an archive and the role of a fact checker. The role of the archive is to preserve the history of content, not to judge it. And um, on one hand, if they feel that having a banner 
at like a disclaimer banner, like the last part that I read there about how, you know, they want to say that this content should not be seen as an, or the fact that they have this content should not be seen as an endorsement. If they want to do that, I think that part is fine because they're basically just saying that they're treating the content in a neutral way, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with it. Uh, I think that most people understand that the internet archive is an archive and that it's user submitted content and it wouldn't even be possible for the people who are maintaining it to endorse the material that they store anyway but maybe there are a lot of stupid people who get mad about this so if they want to do a disclaimer for that reason that's fine but the fact checking i don't i that does not belong there let people use the archive to do the fact checking themselves keep the archive itself neutral um like I can, I can give an example of this. There's uh, a great scene in the movie uh, Das Leben der Anderen, which is the lives of others in English, a really great movie. And the main character, uh, Georg Draymond, goes to, uh, at the end of the movie, well, I shouldn't spoil it. Um, at, at a later point, he goes to an archive um, of, you know, the spies that were making records of him. And he reads through the archive and sees the the notes of this person who was spying on him for a very long period of time. And he reads them and he can tell from the records that the spy made, you know, how the spy was either interpreting the situation or possibly even deliberately rewriting and, you know, not actually accurately reflecting what was happening uh, for different reasons. And, you know, the reason he was able to read that is because an archive was made of that material um, after the fall of the DDR. And so, but the archivist didn't go in and like, it would be like going into the archive and finding your file and you see just notes everywhere that the archivists have made about, oh, they spelled this person's name wrong or this person we found wasn't actually here because it, you know, contradicts this other record here. Like, archivists don't do that. Like, sure, they might have materials available at the premises to, like, you know, people have either published books where they have analyzed the material and maybe they found inconsistencies that are, are important to point out or something like that, but they don't go in and like superimpose those things in the archive itself. Um, that is not the purpose of an archive. The purpose of an archive is to just preserve records. Those records may be false. That is fine because it is equally important to preserve a record of falsified information and to understand what, how that information came to be false, whether it was deliberate or yep. a mistake. It is important to keep that there. Now, if you come in and you are telling the person reading through the archive that it is false, that puts a big onus on you to make sure that your interpretation of it being false is correct. It may not be. Um, it it just turns, it, it just, I feel like it adds so much more load to the archive to have the archive be telling you whether what it archived is true or not. And then the question becomes, well, if you know this isn't true, then why are you even archiving it? Like, you have to have this whole debate about, does it make sense to archive something that is definitely not true? Is there, like, what's what's the cost-benefit analysis of that? Like, we shouldn't be getting into that discussion, <laughs> because that is not the point of an archive. An archive is to keep a record of content that has been available at some point on the internet and how it has changed. That is the point. The point is not to tell you whether the archive is true or false, because... This is the internet. Probably half or more of the shit that you will find in the internet archive is wrong in some way, but the point of an archive is not to go and correct it. It's to just preserve what was there. Yep. This has me thinking even more and more about just decentralizing an internet archive. Like, you need a TLS signature. Um, 
which is a big pain in the ass um, because the only thing I'm aware of that can grab that as an app got broken in most web browsers APIs. Um, a local copy of the website and then an open timestamps proof. Um, like something like that really needs to get built like really quickly. And it would save so much cost for these archive services too, because they wouldn't have to store things themselves anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's like Bitcoin can do more than move money and not enough people are thinking about the utility of tools that use Bitcoin to do more than just move money. Alrighty though. Ready for the next one? Mm hmm. So this uh, you mentioned in the, the last episode, I wanted to kind of go through this now that I have actually had some time to uh, to think this through a little bit. But um, Ruben Samsung's um, like peer to peer lending scheme on uh, liquid. So Pretty much the gist of it is just a multi-sig contract um, where it, somebody who wants to borrow money would take uh, 1.5 times the fiat value and lock that into this contract. So say $10,000 Bitcoin, you want to borrow $10,000, you lock up um, 1.5 Bitcoin in a smart contract that either has a time locked um, timeout transaction where the person giving you the loan um, after so long can just take your Bitcoin as collateral for the loan and sell it. And another transaction um, that the borrower would have where there is his Bitcoin input um, giving him his Bitcoin back but also a commitment to a tether output um, that would give the, the person loaning money back um, their $10,000 plus whatever fee or interest they want to charge. But there is no defined out or input for that tether. And so the idea is that at any time, um, the borrower can come back, um, put their tether input in there, and then claim their Bitcoin back at any time and pay back the loan. But in the event of him not doing that before the timeout is reached, then the um, lender would be able to just liquidate the Bitcoin and walk away. But there's one problem here with this. Um, even having a 50% extra collateral, um, Bitcoin can be very volatile. Um, and so the price crashing down um, could wind up screwing the person making the loan when he doesn't have enough Bitcoin to recoup his fiat value. Um, and to take that another step further, um, people could even try, you know, traders um, and so forth to specifically time uh, a loan like this before a big fall down and actively kind of just take advantage of the lender to pretty much cook together something like a, a Bitcoin option. But I think that problem is pretty easily solved just by hedging. Like whoever is taking the Bitcoin as collateral and loaning fiat, just go put out a short on Bitcoin. And then as the price goes down, you're recouping more Bitcoin. So in net, um, as long as you have your own Bitcoin collateral um, to head short with, um, the, the lender can protect themselves there. And I want to point out that with things like discrete log contracts, um, you can even do that hedging operation in a peer-to-peer -peer way, the same way that this loan um, structure works. And like, really, I think that this is a crazy useful uh, construct in terms of just fiat to crypto interactions that don't have to go through an intermediary. Um, that's now like we, we can do real DeFi. But one thing I, I still want to think more about um, would, would be interesting if you had transactions that would allow the borrower to partially pay back the loan. So rather than have to pay the whole sum back 
and get all their collateral back, you could have some proportional agreement where he would be capable at any time of paying back some sum, getting the resulting amount of BTC back, and then allow the lender to um, keep the rest to, to recoup the part of the loan that you weren't able to pay back. I think there's a lot of potential there to, to make this a lot more granular. But um, yeah, th th this I think is, is a huge piece here that, uh, yeah, I think DeFi is going to uh, become a Bitcoin meme and it's going to drive a lot of the DeFi nuts uh, in the Ethereum world very crazy. Boop. This is a stepping stone to my autistic vision of Liquid itself just being a federated exchange with stuff happening on chain that people can't see. Let's keep taking steps. And speaking of DLCs, um, Atomic Finance, I think, um, was it two weeks ago? Uh, I forget when. Um, he was on Tales from the Crypt with Marty. But this was a company building a bunch of stupid um, ETH DeFi dumb shit. And they have just launched um, their Atomic Finance platform, which is entirely on Bitcoin using DLCs um, to gamble on stuff. And so this is a, a pretty limited beta. Um, you can only have a maximum bet size of 0 0.015 BTC per counterparty of the bet. And the way things are working right now um, is pretty much at the moment, you can only bet on the US um, presidential election and only um, so-called influencers on Twitter are allowed to create bets on the platform for other people to take. So it's a very um, simplistic bare bones thing. And the entire um, setup of the contract is pretty much handled by a web wallet where no party actually puts anything in anybody's custody at any time. And so long term, they're pretty much trying to, um, I don't think at the moment it might be though, because this happened a couple days ago, um, looking to open source everything. And in the future, um, they are trying to move towards anybody being able to create a bet. Um, so not just famous people or what have you. Um, expanding the types of ca and categories of bets. And I think this is going to be what takes the longest because if you think Trump or Biden, that's two outcomes. That's a very simple transaction structure. But the, the more outcomes that are possible in a bet, like there, there's still a lot of work to do in the DLC space to, I think, really spec out standards for more complicated terms of bets. But uh, that, that will eventually come. Um, there's a lot of smart people working hard on that. And as well, a, an Atomic Odds Twitter bot. And just kind of a little, little chuckle thought. Um, I think that would be very interesting from a regulatory point of view to just have a Twitter bot facilitating gambling on Twitter. Would that make Twitter a gambling platform? <laughs> just a, uh, a funny thing to think about. Twitter is definitely a gambling platform. We're all gambling away our lives every time we tweet. But I mean, uh, yeah, like it's... This seems like a, a pretty solid bare bones platform and they're taking a real, um, you know, slow one step at a time roll out of different things. But I think that this kind of stuff for DLCs is probably going to be a big part of how users interact with things for a while because there's there's just a lot to really spec out and consider in terms of a fully local peer-to-peer -peer wallet, like navigating uh, an index of different oracles that might support different types of things, like to, to really build out a, a platform for this stuff that is incredibly decentralized. There, there's a lot of 
other secondary protocols to facilitate that to build from where I'm standing. So I think these types of uh, little web platforms will be the dominant way that these are going to be used for a while to come. And what's the next one? Oh, yeah. There we go. So um, Christopher Allen is one of the biggest contributors of the Gordian system, uh, which is pretty much a suite of software um, that actually, uh, if I remember correctly, a lot of fully noted is based on the uh, work for this software stack here. But um, it's it's a server on the back end, um, simple one-click setup. Um, that will not only um, search for an existing node or an existing Tor instance, but if those don't exist, we'll establish those. If they do, hook up to those, um, set up the uh, the node on the back end. And I couldn't find exactly what in any of the, the readmes or docs in the GitHub repo, but the server um, also supposedly hardens um, some aspects of the operating system configuration to make it a little more secure. And this is all a, a Mac OS um, software stack. And then just a simple scan the QR code um, with the Gordian wallet on iOS, which has a, a lot of the same functionalities as fully noted. And then there is a um, standalone um, Gordian signer app, which is, I believe, on Mac OS, iOS, and Android that is just nothing but a PSBT handler and signing device. Um, it doesn't track balances. It doesn't do anything. It's just, it holds keys. You give it a PSBT and it signs them and spits them back out. And so, you know, I th don't, don't quote me definitively on this, but I feel like fully noted was kind of set up um, building off of this stuff as it was being developed and just kind of incorporating as things go. And so now, um, you know, the, the entire core um, Gordian wallet, uh, Gordian system setup is itself out there now. And this is like, I, I just want to know where did where, where did everything flip on its head where Mac has like some of the coolest flexible Bitcoin software? Like it, it, it's, I'm in a parallel universe now. But like, you know, the, all, this whole project is set up by the uh, Blockchain Commons, a uh, organization that is, is pretty much just trying to build out this kind of open, massively flexible um but still very easy to use um, for normie people software stack. And, um, you know, we've already seen a lot of the, the fruition of that come out and fully noted. And now their Gordian setup is out there too. Like, I, where, where is all this shit for Android and Linux and Windows? Re. Yeah, where is it? Remember when Bitcoin Core only ran on Windows? You remember that? Um, I think that's the only thing I ever ran on Windows. But yeah, the the software in this space is just starting to grow fractally at, at leaps and bounds. Uh, I I can barely even keep up with half of it at this point. Yep. All right, though. Why don't you tell us what Verizon did, um, which just was mind-bogglingly confusing to me when I saw this. Oh, don't worry. It's still mind-bogglingly confusing. Um, so on Friday, Nick Carter shared an announcement from Verizon, of all things, that they are going to launch a blockchain verification tool called Full Transparency for news releases specifically corporate news releases and so the announcement says verizon today announced the launch of full transparency by verizon They're kind of repetitive there uh, a blockchain-based open source newsroom product designed to raise the bar for corporate accountability this initiative seeks to transform how the verizon corporate newsroom publishes news releases by providing an authoritative record of changes to public communications 
Official news releases that incorporate full transparency are tracked on the blockchain ledger, so news releases or statements can be treated as authoritatively reflecting what was intended to be released. All news releases published to the Verizon newsroom will be secured and bound using cryptographic principles so that subsequent changes can be tracked and contextualized. So, uh, here, yeah, so I read this and I was like, okay, buzzwords, not clear, no, no details, like, where, where is this happening? What What is it? Because, like, already they're saying, you know, using the blockchain to make sure that statements are treated as authoritatively reflecting what was intended to be released. That is a big, that is a big ask, okay? That's not something blockchains do, so I am already suspicious. Um, and then on Twitter, the CEO of Verizon, Hans uh, Vestberg, said, Trust in information is critical. Using blockchain technology, we're implementing full transparency, a digital ledger that tracks all information changes in our corporate newsroom. It's a new standard we're proud to introduce and one we hope others will adopt. So, again, very unclear from the statement and very unclear from the tweets whether they are going to even use an existing blockchain or going to make their own blockchain because this tweet makes it sound like they're going to make their own blockchain. And yeah. So they claim that they will be or have built this proof of concept in partnership with Huge, Mad Network, and AdLedger. And until this announcement, I had never heard of any of those companies, so I doubt that any of you will have either. We will get to that soon. But first of all, uh, I should point out that I've, uh, if you've been following my work at all, you've seen that I've criticized various journalism on the blockchain. I mean, I would classify this as journalism on the blockchain, even though it's more of like corporate press releases and such. Um, but anyway, I've criticized various journalism on the blockchain projects over the years, mostly because in my own research, I've come to the conclusion that a minimalist approach is best, not only to avoid inflating the benefit of blockchains when it comes to combating fake news and censorship, but also because using blockchain systems improperly for the purposes of, for example, decentralized storage or truth machines, as they've been called, is not only impractical, but it usually damages the long-term viability of the underlying system. So if you want to hear more about that, uh, I actually talked a lot about it during my presentation at the Lightning Conference last year. One second while I scroll into this very long list of notes about all of these weird companies. Alrighty, so... The first one, uh, well, actually, I should also mention my most prominent takedown of uh, one of these projects was the consensus back civil media thing. I won't rehash that entire mess, but if you want to hear more about the background of why these types of projects do not make me happy, um, well, that project finally put itself down in the last year or so, and you can hear more about that in episodes 131, 132, 133, 169, and most recently 232, um, if you care about that. Um, the reason I bring it up is because when I was reading through these websites and announcements, I was getting a very familiar vibe as the one that I got from reading the stuff about civil media. So yeah, first of all, variety. Um, why Verizon? I am not really sure what interest or expertise Verizon has in media credibility or corporate accountability, and I immediately got the sense that this is maybe one of those money grab type initiatives where, you know, we've seen a few of those in the past couple of years where companies either put the word blockchain in their company name all of a sudden, or they put it in a new product, even though it has nothing to do with blockchains or it gets no benefit from blockchains most of the time. So Verizon, no idea why Verizon is doing this. Um, probably they just have money to throw around. And then there's Huge, which uh, given the times we're living in, I couldn't help hearing the annoying voice of the soon to be or not to be president when I read that. Huge. Um, I had never heard of Huge, so I looked for their website and found a page for Huge Inc. that said, hello, uh, in like size 100 font, 
which I guess makes sense because they're called huge. But I continued to look at their website, and after five minutes of reading, I still had very little idea of what the hell this company does. Um, they do want people to know that they support Black Lives Matter, though. Um, I noticed that um, for what it's worth. Um, but they seem to be a brand development and product marketing company, which explains a lot about why I've never heard of them because they can't even represent their own brand well on their website to the point where I don't know what they do. Uh, it took me a while. But yeah, so don't really know anything about Huge or what the point of their partnership involvement is. Then there is Mad Network. And so while trying to figure out what Mad Network is, um, I came across several 404 pages for you know, their white paper and things like that. Um, the white paper is now available to download in exchange for doxing your name and email and company to them first. No, thank you. Um, I did eventually find a page that describes what they are in a kind of reboot announcement that they made back in August, uh, which I will scroll to read now. And, like, the only reason I'm reading uh, this stuff is because I feel like, you know, given that they've already 404'd a bunch of their pages and they've done an ICO, by the way, I suspect that a lot of their other stuff will disappear and maybe this will be relevant when they, you know, get sued by the SEC or something. But it says, uh, Mad Network is a custom blockchain purpose-built for enterprise applications. It is designed for any market or group of actors to manage authenticated identity across assets, organizations, devices, and people. Enterprises are leveraging it to automate trusted transactions based on their uh, based on the certified identity. It is a layer two solution on top of Ethereum. So we benefit from their security <laughs> or their insecurity. Um, Madhive is integrating it to automate ad as in advertising transactions between authenticated counterparties, creating, trans te creating technical guarantees that contractual obligations are fulfilled. While Mad Network was initially designed for ad tech, we believe that this technology has many use, ca many use cases in virtually every industry with further implications for the broader Ethereum community. Oh, goody. Uh, well, the reason I find this inter interesting is that when civil finally shut its doors they said that they were going into advertising and i'm kind of curious if they joined this whole mad network thing um because that's what they said they were gonna do um but the funniest part is their homepage because it lists three characteristics of the mad network one scale Create sophisticated and flexible mechanisms for data storage and expiration, lowering costs and increasing speed so your business can scale. Two, authenticity. Create sophisticated and flexible mechanisms for data storage and expiration, lowering costs and increasing speed so your business can scale. Number three, privacy. Create sophisticated and flexible mechanisms for data storage and expiration, lowering costs and increasing speed so your business can scale. And if you think I just read the same buzzword-filled description exactly three times in a row, you'd be right, because they literally just copy and pasted the same generic bullshit three times. No details whatsoever. Maybe Mad Network should get some branding and website design help from Huge, or Huge, or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, disaster. Um, last but not least, Ad Ledger. And Ad Ledger is founded by a guy named Adam Helfgott, who also happens to be the CEO of Mad Network. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, and according to this website, Ad Ledger is a nonprofit charged with building and implementing technical standards for the application of blockchain and cryptography to media and advertising. Founded by IBM, Madhive, and Tecna in 2018. And again, to read their white paper, you need to provide a name and company and job title and email address. No thanks. Uh, just publish it when you're ready to play with the big boys, people. Um, but yeah, there's a little bit more. One second as I find the page. Yeah, so they, again, don't provide very much information on their website about products or services. Um, but there's a page called Standards, which says the following. Open source cryptographic extensions to open RTB protocol proposed by the Ad Ledger Consortium to improve the integrity of digital advertising eco the digital advertising ecosystem by creating an immutable identity for supply chain participants, a verifiable chain of custody, and sophisticated tools for data access and validation. Wow, that's mouthful. But there's more. 
crypto RTB achieves these goals by inserting an encrypted object into the open RTB bus that contains two sections, the digital signature and a set of claims. A digital signature is a cryptographic technique used to pr uh, prove the authenticity of a message and the identity of its originator. Crypto RTB protocol proposes a digital signature comprised of a public key and a private key. The public key is shared in open RTB messages and is stored on a public blockchain so that anyone can validate the public identity of a given party. The private key is necessary for a party to create their digital signature, but is never shared in order to maintain security. The claim section can include anything the originator of the message would like to certify as true, such as metadata like domain name, player size, buyer seat, advertiser domain, etc., or first party user data. So yeah, um after that whole description, the the gist of it is that they their 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 thing is to sign something and to put it on a blockchain. And this helps advertising. I, I'm very impressed. Are you impressed, Shinobi? <laughs> No, my head just started hurting. Um, if you're not doing money stuff, um, just use open timestamps. Like, and advertising, yep, yep. it's just, just use, like, oh my god, my head hurts. Yeah, so, um, this is the Verizon project. These are the partners of Verizon's full transparency project. So, in conclusion, um, side note, thanks to Nick Carter for the shout out because when he mentioned this he cited you know the article that uh he had written months ago that mentioned my revision control journalism project and then he um cited one of my documents so that's cool um unfortunately this initiative does not sound like it's doing anything remotely close to the minimalist thoughtful model that people like me and peter todd have been talking about for years now and my conclusion at this point is to get the old, for God's sake, use open time stamps stamp. Because seriously, if there's anything that VC bullshit sprinkle money should go to instead, that is the kind of tool you need. It is the kind of tool that works and it has a track record much more than this Verizon newsroom thing. But of course, they're only trying to change corporate newsrooms, which are so godforsakenly boring so they can do whatever they want of course but um why complicate things for so little benefit yep it's like oh my god it's just just you just use open timestamps. you're not moving bitcoin there is no block size it's freaking practically free just use it re yep Alrighty though, um, I think the next up thing is a pretty relevant situation to a uh, a real version of something like that would be useful here, um, as long as it wasn't a clown show. Yeah, so I was a fan of The Intercept for a number of years because they've published a number of great investigations and... Uh, on a few occasions still continue to publish great articles. For example, there was one um, about the Assange trial in particular. I'll have to mention it later because it, it was a really good summary. Um, of course, the reason The Intercept is famous is because they uh, were, they are and were the only outlet with the full archive as a result of the fact that they were founded by Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald directly, and they both have copies. Um, and so, yeah, you can even uh, find a tweet from me back in March 2015 where I tweeted at them, it's organizations like yours which make every day Freedom of, Freedom of Information Day. Thank you for all your hard work. And they actually thank me back. Um, so now that's kind of bitter. Um, and it was very disappointing to me in March last year, 2019, when it was announced that the Snowden archive would be closed for reasons of cost, which on the one hand, I don't actually believe that. On the other hand, if that is the reason, that is so infuriatingly bizarre that that would be the reason. 
Um, also, they did so without even telling Snowden himself first. Um, imagine closing an archive that's literally named after the guy who risked his life to bring you documents that won you journalism awards and not even telling him about it, uh, where he is one of the last people to hear about it, actually. And the reason uh, you give is that the rest of the documents that you have, for whatever reason, decided not to publish aren't valuable enough. Um and the Intercept has already had, you know, lots of people criticize them about this over the years. In fact, they were basically criticizing them from the beginning due to the slow pace of the publication of the documents. And still today, less than 10% of the Snowden documents have been published as a result. And so even though Glenn was involved in that decision and seems to have agreed with it, according to emails uh, involving portraits that came to be published around that time uh i knew at that point that his stay at the intercept would probably be limited because any media organization that would make a decision like that is not one where good investigative journalists stay for very long and so on october 29th a few days ago he wrote uh in a very long statement but i will read the relevant portion as of now, I will be publishing my journalism here on Substack, where numerous other journalists, including my good friend, the great in intrepid reporter Matt Taibbi, have come in order to practice journalism free of the increasingly repressive climate that is engulfing national mainstream media outlets across the country. This is not an easy choice. I am voluntarily sacrificing the support of a large institution and guaranteed salary in exchange for nothing other than a belief that there are enough people who believe in the virtues of independent journalism and the need for free discourse, who will be willing to support my work by subscribing. Like anyone with young children, a family, and numerous obligations, I do this with some trepidation, but also with conviction that there is no other choice. I could not sleep at night knowing that I allowed any institution to censor what I want to say and believe. Least of all, a media outlet I co-founded with the explicit goal of ensuring this never happens to other journalists, let alone me, let alone because I have written an article critical of a powerful... Democratic politician vehemently supported by the editors in the imminent national election. Um, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, you can just read his statement about why he thinks he got fired. There's also a thread that's interesting from Kevin uh, Gustola, um, who Greenwald in his first statement kind of hinted at, but did not mention or name explicitly where um, basically one of the reasons he has been upset with The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald has been upset with them, is because you may have noticed they did very little coverage of the Assange trial in September. Like, they were not doing daily coverage. You know, they put out, you know, a few articles, and that's it. Whereas, you know, uh, Kevin, on the other hand, was was accessing the court daily, providing daily updates, uh, not only daily updates in the form of like uh, a video stream after, but like he was reporting on what people were saying in the court. Um, the Intercept was not doing that. And in fact, according to Kevin, on the day that the trial started, Glenn apparently reached out to Kevin and was like, hey, we would like to get access, you know, remote access to the court. Um and for anyone who <laughs> doesn't know, um, that was not possible because you basically had to apply like days, if not weeks in advance to get access to the court remotely. Um, and you had to be approved. And actually there was a controversy on the first day because there was like 40 or so applicants who had not yet been approved for remote access. And the judge literally just said, I'm, I hadn't actually reviewed these applications, and so I'm just going to deny them all now. So 40 people slash organizations who were expecting to get access to Assange's trial did not get access. And so the fact that, you know, I mean, <laughs> Glenn Greenwald is one of the journalists who has worked with WikiLeaks in the past and worked on publications with them. And so the fact that The Intercept put no effort whatsoever into covering the trial is kind of amazing. And the and Kevin is a completely independent journalist and did such a, such a better job than I think any of them would have done anyway. Um, but it's just really strange. 
Yeah, I mean, this it's just really fucked up that we are at this point where very credible claims of things tantamount to treason, like of a sitting vice president, get somebody like Glenn, like he loses his job over, he can't talk about that, he can't mention something like that going on in a journalistic context, like that is insane. Like that is the whole purpose of journalism in situations like this to ascertain like that is this factual? Is this not factual? Like people need to figure this thing out because they need to incorporate that into their decision making in society. That is the entire fucking reason journalists exist. Yeah, and something else that is really bizarre, I mean, kind of in defense of Glenn here, I haven't seen, well, he's defended himself already, but something I want to point out, not that anyone who would actually say this is probably watching, but there are some people who, I mean, I think they have motives other than, that are something other than genuine, but there are literally people who are bringing up that, oh, Glenn is helping Trump or Glenn is a fascist or he's a fascist sim sympathizer. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. And I mean, you can watch the interview that he did with Matt Taibbi where he talks about this, but I find it really bizarre that people are like, he, he <laughs> like, uh, I feel like it's just it's 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 someone who kind of are, is jumping into the conversation and doesn't actually know him at all. Because if you've watched the stuff that he's been publishing over the last year, you would know that he's literally challenging the Bolsonaro government in Brazil, and Bolsonaro is considered to be even more far right than Trump. So. And he's literally being targeted for that. He has, it, that's also part of what, why it's a big deal they left their intercept is that they were paying for his security. And he says that he hasn't left his house without a security team in a while. Um, like he's literally challenging the, the president of Brazil, which is a hugely influential country. Um, so the idea that he's a fascist is just so it doesn't make any sense to me and i feel like i said it's not a genuine criticism i feel like it's just one of those things that people say about people they don't like with with no backing whatsoever but um Jeanine, if you want to just see... say hugely i knew you were a secret trump supporting fascist no <laughs> if, if if that was the case i would have said hugely with a y because People don't know how to pronounce H's. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, yesterday on October 31st, he actually published a follow-up thanking people for the support. And he also linked to various interviews he had done regarding why he left The Intercept. So that's why I'm not really going to get into the details of that. Um, he also made some, you know... Uh, speeches about problems with the broader media landscape and I watched a few and I do appreciate many of his criticisms and I believe it's important for more journalists who care about their freedom of speech to beware of this uh, benevolent billionaire model that The Intercept very much um, succumbed to and maybe Glenn will be open to accepting Bitcoin <laughs> at some point um, but at the end of the day I'm still in general just really disappointed that there is a large amount of information that is not only being gatekeeped, but it is gatekeeped with gates that may never open again because the people keeping the gates are, are or were making hundreds of thousands of dollars and don't believe in the value of that information being free anymore. So it's great that, you know, he has decided to become independent, but there is still a vast trove of documents that uh concern things related to bitcoin that many people might want to know uh or at least some people might want to know in advance before other people find out somehow and yeah 
be great if that information was free and I could actually say that the Intercept as an organization still represented uh, Freedom of Information Day. Yeah, I wouldn't bet on that though. But, you know, something um, loosely related to this though, to circle back to reuse open timestamps. Um, re regarding uh, all of the the Biden matters um, that Glenn uh, wanted to write about and was not allowed to um, are the emails um, among many things um, from a computing device. And Peter Todd um, has verified that the DKIM key um, that signed those emails um, was in fact a DK or DKIM key that Google was using back in 2016 um, because he had around that time period timestamped a email of his own um, from Google that is signed by the same key. Um, and so it's, it's just, uh, yeah, that is an amazing crypto magic thing. And the only argument against that would be that key was compromised at some subsequent point, um, proven by open timestamps, latching into Bitcoin in, in an undeniable way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just really interesting right now with how crazy politics is getting and how insane people are getting at totally fabricating things, how this little random time stamping tool on Bitcoin um, has proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that Google did in fact use that DKIM key, um, which matches to the one in those other emails um, back in 2016. So that is now something that cannot be contested, period. It's proven thermodynamically. For anyone who doesn't know, DKIM stands for Domain Keys Identified Mail. And this is not a new method of checking the authenticity of emails that have been leaked uh, or released somehow, because this is the same way that also the Podesta emails were verified back in 2016. Mm-hmm. It's just, I, I love how open timestamps adds the extra aspect of it. You could literally just send test as an email through any service and then timestamp that and just create temporal maps of keys that different entities were using and they can't deny that. Yep. Oh, magic. All right. So three more to go. So next up, um, Avanti Financial has officially um, gotten their special uh, purpose depository institution license in Wyoming. So they are officially um, open for business. Um, now they just need to effectively raise capital, um, be granted a certificate of authority to operate, and they will be a functional bank institution and move along to issuing the weird Avit token um, that I, I think I, I referred to as the the attempt to create the Hal Finney future of Bitcoin. But um, yeah, I, I think pretty soon it's off to the races and we're going to see a lot of uh, shifting back to the wildcat banking and then honestly, I'm just going to machine gun through these other two because not really much details for either. Um, also, um, DBS, a uh, Singapore-backed bank, um, accidentally um, put up a, a website that should not have been posted um, because they do not have regulatory approval for this yet. But they are planning on um, building a digital assets trading platform and planning on trading uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ether, and Ripple against the Singapore dollar, Hong Kong dollar, Japanese yen, and US dollar. And uh, pretty much uh, since they got uh, 
caught with the Whoopsies Publish page. Um, they've acknowledged it, um, but are refusing to make any further comments or announcement until regulatory approval is granted. Um, but they are planning on, in the stack, um, setting up their own institutional grade, um, air quotes, um, custody solution that they would manage themselves. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I think that would be a very interesting dynamic in terms of uh, Southeast Asia. And then I guess last little announcement. Um, for anybody thinking about the uh, YouTube DL uh, repo removal from GitHub, um, Andrew Chow has written a script, although it, it'll take a while to run because uh, GitHub rate limits the uh, API. But it, it will download any github repo locally including all the uh random metadata like uh pull requests comments on that um you know any wikis or, or release assets attached to things so it, it will snapshot the entire repo um completely so if anybody wants to start playing around grabbing mirrors of the bitcoin core repo or really any repo um this is a, a simple little script, which is ironically called GitHub-DL. Do it with my repos. Do it with all the repos you have hard drive space for. You can try it on my privacy newsletter. Alrighty, though. Uh, I think that is that, and it is final thoughts time. Um, well, uh, I hope... Uh... Hope we're not all dead next week. <laughs> I plan on attending the voting ritual with my Make Kekistan Free Again hat wearing my Kekistani flag cape. And I'm going to write in a vote for Kek. Good for you. I think I should talk to Atomic Finance about taking bets on whether I get attacked and, and, and called a Nazi for that. I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I am safely far away from all of that. Well, count yourself lucky. All right, the, you got any final thought to cough up? Um, well, I thought it was hilarious yesterday. There was uh, one of those satire sites, um, Babylon B, um, published an article that said, Ron Paul frightens trick-or-treaters by jumping out and telling them about the national debt, uh, which is good Halloween uh post i think because also it was bitcoin's uh white paper birthday that that paper is not a parody at this point it's the the last real news paper it's it's real news yeah oh well, i guess only random thing floating around on my head is uh somebody just posted a uh a uh, bandwidth test um, using the Starlink uh, beta tester kit and hit a 134 megabits per second down and 14 up with a ping time of 38 milliseconds um, from very fast moving low orbit satellites that are going to have 10 times more of them up there. Um, and Elon jumped in and said expect both the uh the down and up throughput and the latency to go down soon so yeah i think we are by next year in for a very very fun world where the only people who shouldn't be considering um playing with a starlink dish and a distributed mesh of uh internet satellites are going to be people with fiber who get 10 times throughput and would whine about it. But for the rest of us, um, yeah, the future is looking very cyberpunk. Well, the, the future of cyberpunk has been delayed by a month or so, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, as long as that's rolling around by next summer, um, getting out of beta, um, that is going to be some really cool ass shit. I was talking about the video game. No! Why did you remind me of that? Now I'm going to go be depressed. I hate you. Yes, yes, they did. Uh, you got anything else to add? 
Or can I take us out and go mope about that? You can go mope. It will be a mopey week. Well, I guess that's a wrap. I'll catch you later, punks. I'm going to go be depressed that the best-looking video game of the year got delayed. Adios. Bye. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head.